it was recommended that all healthcare professionals should be vaccinated. And that this includes medical professionals, as well as other workers who are in the hospital and outpatient setting, medical emergency response workers, as well as anybody trained. And so if you're a ward clerk working in a hospital, if you're a secretary working in a hospital, you're in a healthcare setting, you're going to transmit and share virus, you should be vaccinated. And as you've heard, New York State has taken it one step further and has now mandated vaccination across the hospital. And it's because of this, when we take a look at the pediatric population, which should be the easiest population to vaccinate, because they're used to coming in for vaccines, we're very, very poor. Less than 50% of the population who should be vaccinated ever get vaccinated in any given year. This was 06. This has been mirrored year after year after year. We're not very good at getting kids back in to get vaccinated. It's a narrow window. Vaccine is only available for a period of October through February or March. Kids come in in the summer for their preschool camp physicals. They don't remember to come back in. We're busy. They come in and they're sick, so you don't give it to them, and they don't come back. All the reasons and excuses, but ultimately we only vaccinate half of the kids. And even more worrisome, is of the children who get one vaccine, if they're less than eight, they need a booster. Four weeks later, you see, less than 25% of them ever get their second booster. So they're not protected in that first year. And the rule is if you get, in your first year, if you're eight years of age and under, you need two vaccines, four, year, four months apart, four weeks apart. If you don't get two vaccines in the first year, then in your second year, you should get two vaccines, four weeks apart. If you don't get it in your second year, in the third year you're down to just one vaccine because you've had two years leading up to it, so you don't need that second vaccine in the third year regardless. But you try to give that second vaccine in either the first or the second year at the end of the day. What vaccines do we have available? Well, there are really two forms. You have the standard trivalent, and you have the, um, the live attenuated influenza vaccine. FDA approved these in the years that you see. We've had trivalent since the 60s. The, the, uh, the, live, the live attenuated since 2003. The road of administration is different. The road of administration is intramuscular versus intranasal, and the difference relates to the humoral response. We get only a humoral response, IgG response, with the standard killed trivalent vaccine, where we get a mucosal cellular response, T cell response, as well as that immunoglobulin response with that. And I'll show you why in just a moment, but it really comes down to what you're giving. Ultimately, you're giving subunits that are inactivated that are standardized for hemagglutinin, whereas with the live attenuated, you're giving an adapted whole virus particle. So you're giving the entire virus, which will simulate a full immunologic response as opposed to just an immunoglobulin response. The growth medium is the same. They're both grown in chicken eggs. Give you neutralizing antibody to the hemagglutinin. But with a fly virus, since it has the potential to replicate and has other epitopes, you get a more complete immunologic response, stimulating your cellular immune system, the T cell and mucosal portion of the response, not just the B cell. You're also going to have active antibodies to neuraminidase, as well as the other internal proteins, which would not be present in the inactive. And really the reason this is important is because cytokine involvement, and as I alluded to earlier, cytokine storm is an important part of what makes us sick, and in some cases our mortality. Influenza, although localized, will cause the release of a number of cytokines, and it looks like IL-6 and interferon alpha are two of the most important, which are responsible for the sickness, the symptoms that we have as in, in the disease. But we also know that interferon alpha induces natural killer T cell activity, and that's your first line of defense when it comes to fighting off influenza viral infection. So the ability to have gluten, whereas the live attenuated is hemagglutinin and neuraminidase combined with the core protein. And the way that occurs is that there's a master donor virus which has been attenuated so that it cannot replicate at body temperature. So once you, when you mix this master donor virus to the wild type hemagglutinin and neuraminidase genes are transmitted or are attached to your core. And so you now have the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase 
that you expect in the present season combined with the core from the master donor which is attenuated so it will not replicate in body temperature. So called cold adapted. And so it's able to replicate at 25 degrees centigrade but it is unable to replicate below th above 37 degrees centigrade. But since you're giving it in the nasal mucosa, you get activation of immunity beginning here, which includes that T cell responsiveness at the end of the day. The studies, I think, are, are very are, uh, are interesting, and they're all published in major journals. This was published in the New England Journal back in 2007, study of over 8,400 children. These were 6 to 59 months of age in the 2004 live flu season. The exclusion criteria are as you see here. They wanted just a pure group of healthy children, so they excluded all these other comorbidities at the end of the day. And they wanted to make sure there was an equal spread across every age subgroup, so there's an equal number of patients who are 6 to 23 months, 24 to 35, and 36 to 59, as well as an equal number who had previous infection, equal number who had the presence or absence of a history of wheeze, as well as their county residents, country residents. So they tried to make it as equal across the board as they could so that the groups were comparable at the end of the day. The primary endpoint was culture-confirmed CDC-defined influenza-like illness against the antigenically matched strain of virus. So they looked to see what virus was in that specific community and if it was matched to the, to the vaccine, versus it was infection by mismatched virus to the vaccine over the course of the study period. They both study looked at the attack rate of matched virus and the attack rate of mismatched virus. That is virus that had a different antigen than what the vaccine was supposedly protecting us for. They also looked at the safety endpoints that are important, especially medically significant wheezing. That's wheezing that required medical care and treatment. What they found, and this is in the two-year-olds to five-year-olds, was that compared to inactivated flu vaccine, our standard flu vaccine, there was a 52% reduction in attack rate, or in cases, against the matched virus, a 54% reduction against mismatched virus. So it was clear that it afforded, at least in this pediatric population, a greater degree of protection even when the vaccine was not matched to the virus that circulated in the community, with an overall drop of 54% in total cases for the end of that flu season period. Another study had been done a number of years earlier, and this was a study that actually led them to think that this might occur. This was a two-year study. It was a planned two-year study to see the continued protection of patients given flu vaccine in two consecutive years. And it turned out that in the first year of the study, 1996, the vaccine was well matched to what was in the community. But in the second year, the vaccine strain was not matched to what was in the community. So we had, strictly by accident, a mismatched year in the second year of the study. And of the 1,600 children who were vaccinated during the first year, they were able to get back 1,358 of the same children in the second year for their second vaccine. Comparing it, in this case, to placebo, they found, as you would expect, a huge drop-off in attack rate in the first year against matched virus compared to placebo. But they also found a very nice drop-off in protection or in attack rate, even in the second year, which turned out to be a mismatched virus, two-year vaccine. So I think it gives us a nice feeling for what the benefit is. And when you take a look at the last 12 years, six of them have been a mismatched year. That is, in six of the last 12 years, the vaccine that we give has not been a match to the influenza that circulated in the community at large. And so it tells us just how imprecise we are on a year-by-year -year basis. And that's what leads many people to think influenza vaccine doesn't work all that well. And it's really our ability to predict what's going to circulate in that community. The safety endpoints that were looked at went through 180 days of hospitalization and they looked at medically significant wheezing up to six weeks after the dose. And they found that in this population of two to six year olds, hospitalization rate was no different. In fact, it was a little bit less in the patients who were given the live attenuated 
And the wheezing rate was actually a little bit less for a given line attenuated. It was in the 12 to 24 month old group that they saw an increase in wheezing, and they also saw an increase in all cause hospitalization. But when they analyzed that data, it turned out that the reason for hospitalization was more from GI diarrhea, dehydration, not from respiratory disease. And so they're still not sure what that means, but it was only in the youngest 12 to 24 month group that they saw that. But because of that signal, they've been very cautious in expanding it to a younger group, and they've also been very cautious in expanding it to a group of children who are Weezers, who are asthmatics. And that's why you see the present proportion. Not because you sort data in the two-year-old group, but because of data in a younger group and our uncertainty as to what it means yet across the larger population. And ongoing studies are going to be done to take a look at that.